Well, hey, Life Science. Hope you're doing well when you watch this video. Um, hope you and your family are doing well through this self isolation process. Um, this is lesson one. I'm going to go through lesson one with you early study of evolution. Hope you've already read it and done the questions. But I still want to point out a few important topics that you need to make note of for the future. So the objectives for this, I would like for you to be able to explain how organisms change over time and support you know, the theory of evolution using the explanations and the data, the evidence I'm going to talk to you about. Of course, evolution and the Bible do not agree on every single thing, especially the important things like where humans came from. We believe that humans were created from the dust by God. Evolution teaches that we all came from a common ancestor. And so I want to teach you, um, hopefully, to be able to determine the differences and also see how the Bible does allow change to happen, but only within a kind. Um, so if I were to ask you, what is this organism? And I'll pause and, you know, I would call a few of you in class, of course. But this is a zonkey or a zebroid organism. Um, it's between a zebra and a donkey. You can see, you know, the stripes right there. Pretty, you know, we don't have socks that cool. That's pretty cool. And, but is a, zon a zonkey comes from a zebra and a donkey, but is a zebra related to a donkey? Are they the same species? And the answer is no, why not? And so that's the first thing that I want to talk to you about. A species is a group of similar organisms that can mate with each other and also, and here's the key point, create fertile offspring. So not only can they mate with each other, but they can also create offspring that also have the ability to reproduce. In Florida, we have three different squirrel species. Now, they cannot create viable fertile offspring. Most of the time you see a squirrel, probably looks like the gray squirrel over here. And you can see that there's actually a flying squirrel in Florida. You have to be out at night, they're nocturnal. But these are the three different squirrel species in Florida, and these are their scientific names. I'll be going over nomenclature in a second, but remember Careless Linnaeus, domain through species. And so these are their technical names of the squirrel species in Florida. But Darwin was curious. Darwin, of course, loved nature, naturalist. Nature is amazing. I encourage you to get outside during this time. Don't spend all your side indoors. Take a walk, go for a bike ride, do something to get outside because walls inside the house will drive anyone a little bonkers after a little bit. But he saw all these variations. You can see all these different skin colors. We have so many different variations that we see in humans. We, we did that exercise in class where I remember the lobes and the, the hitchhiker's thumb and dimples and freckles and we have all sorts of variations but darwin when he was traveling around the planet he saw variations in life as well these are some of the finches that he saw and you notice like look at the different size beaks and darwin was kind of questioning all this like why is there so much variation would god really create each species like this and i'll talk to you in a second about how darwin had a misunderstanding of what genesis actually says so Darwin, along with others, and I'll talk to you about the others here in a second, but he developed the idea of evolution. Evolution in your book is defined as the process by which modern organisms have descended from ancient organisms. According to evolution, humans descend from like an ape-like creature. That's not what the Bible teaches. Evolution teaches that there's changes, and we do see that in life, changes happen, but Christians would argue there's change within a kind. So this is from Darwin's book, you can see, and by the way, modern science is questioning this. They're actually saying that sometimes species can crossbreed, but that's not really for right now. But this is kind of a tree of, of life that Darwin sketched. He was like, okay, well, here's an ancient organism here, and then variation happens here, and it all came from that one place that now is in his notebook. However, that's, again, like I said, that's not what the Bible teaches. And it matters. Hopefully, you dived into what a worldview means in the discussion board. but it matters what you believe. So as with everyone, Darwin had influencers. And some of the ones that your book points out, these are definitely not, it's, this is definitely not an exhaustive list. He had many other people who influenced him. But your book points out Careless Linnaeus, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and Charles Lyell and Mary Anning. Okay, so let's go through each of these guys. Careless Linnaeus, we already talked about him. He developed nomenclature, binomial nomenclature, the ability to name organisms. 
And so hopefully you remember that this is, you know, you get really specific to species and you get really general down here domains, so domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And of course, I told you that humans, we are homo sapiens. Homo is our genus and sapiens is our species classification. Not only Carolus Linnaeus influenced Darwin, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck did as well. He was actually the first one to kind of think that organisms change over time. But he argued that whatever an organism acquires in its lifetime is passed on to the next generation. For example, if I got really strong doing weights, and if I, super strong, I could pass that strength on to or my offspring. You know, Ella Grace would be like super strong. And of course you can kind of consider like this is not the case, but this is a famous example of his. He argued that the reason giraffes necks are so long is because over time they kept stretching and stretching and stretching. And, and because they kept stretching for those leaves, they passed on that acquired characteristic that they got in life. Darwin and Wallace did not argue that. They argued that variation just naturally happens and whatever genes provide the best chance to survive and reproduce would make it on to the next generation due to more successful um, living rates and birth rates. And so not only did Carlos Linnaeus and John Baptiste Lamarck influence Darwin, a man by the name of Charles Lyell did as well. One of the things on my bucket list is to visit the Grand Canyon. Colorado River kind of snakes through it. According to evolution, it took millions of years for the Colorado River to form the Grand Canyon. Some Christians might agree with that. Some Christians don't they would argue probably that the flood did it very fast. Um, we're not here to debate that, although it is a fun, interesting debate. Charles Lyell, though, argued that the Earth's been around for billions of years. And processes that occurred then still occur now at the same pace. So Darwin knew about his work, and he was like, well, if the Earth changes over time, Darwin experienced earthquakes and volcanoes on, the, on a trip I'm about to tell you about that he went on. He's like, why can't life change as well? And so not only Charles Lyle, John Baptiste Lamarck, Carolus Linnaeus, but also Mary Anning. This is from the website you can see at the bottom of the stream, but Mary's contribution had a major impact at a time when there was little to challenge the biblical interpretation of the story of creation and of the flood. So again, this secular website is coming right for the Bible. The spectacular marine reptiles that Mary unearthed, so she's digging for fossils. Pretty impressed with some of the finds. I'm gonna show you a picture here in a second. She found the first complete ich ichthyosaur in 1810, 1811. And so people at this time thought the earth was really young. Now there's brilliant Christians now that was like, well, no, the Genesis actually allows for, you know, old times. Some Christians wouldn't agree with that, some Christians would. But this is a fossil that she found. Now this guy wasn't huge. Some of his relatives were ginormous, but this was a marine reptile. She found the first one completely intact in the rock. And so she made huge influence. So Darwin understood all these things happening in the planet. So this is him about the time he went on this main voyage. He was invited to travel on the HMS Beagle, um, Her Majesty's ship. And the Beagle is a famous name thrown out a lot in science. And so on, while on this voyage, he was comparing his education with his observations. He couldn't reconcile the two. He couldn't bring the boat together. He actually, I signed you that homework about what Charles Darwin studied and who, where it came from parents. But he actually studied to be a minister. A lot of people don't know that. But he actually studied to be a minister in the Church of England. And then he forsook all of his upbringing and religious background because he couldn't, he couldn't wrap his mind around Genesis and what he was seeing. And, how, and a lot of studies from Christians have, of course, done that. Genesis lines up in these ways. And so his famous book he wrote in 1859, it took many years for him to kind of gather all his thoughts together to publish but it's a famous book in the realm of science, The Origin of Species. So this is him at his young age. This is him at, at an older age. Kind of lost a smile a little bit, but you know, it's okay. Um, this is his journey. You don't have to know exactly where he stopped, but it took five years. Would you be on a boat for five years? And this is not a cruise ship. This is not a buffet, water slides, entertainment every night. This is a wooden vessel that you think of, you know, in the 1800s. Um, he got sick many times on this trip. He found beautiful things. He hated many different things. But one of the most famous places that you always hear about when you hear about Charles Darwin is right here in the Galapagos Islands. It was over here that he really started to develop his thoughts about what is happening 
through time as far as species go. He collected fossils while he was on the trip. This is a picture from your from your book. He saw he found a fossil of Glyptodon, which is a relative of the armadillo. He saw variations between the mainland and the Galapagos Islands. So he saw coloration differences and beak changes. And he's thinking all this time, why would God specifically create all these different species? He didn't realize that God created kinds not species. I encourage you to read Genesis. It says kinds. And so while he was on the Galapagos Islands, he saw very different finches with different sized beaks. And the beaks were specially like designed almost to, to eat certain fruit, to eat certain plants, seeds. And so he was uncomfortable right here with the notion that God would have expressly created 14 varieties of finches to inhabit these islands, especially since they were all different from the few dominant varieties on the mainland. He reasoned that the bird's isolation on the islands had itself brought about gradual changes that had resulted in the different varieties he observed. But that's not an issue today to most Christians. We, we understand and believe that God created kinds, and there can be variations within the kind, but we differ on where those kinds come from and what exactly defines a kind. Human beings are not part of an ape-like kind. Human beings are a standalone creation that God created from the dust of the ground. So these are all considered adaptations. The different size beaks, the different size, um, you know, fossils that, you know, possibly gave rise to adaptations as far as like, you know, longer limbs, et cetera, so on and so forth. So adaptations is an inherited trait that increases an organism's chance of surviving and reproducing. This is an increase of the ability to survive, live, and also pass those genes on through uh, DNA in the offspring, okay? And so these are examples of some of the finches. You can see all these different finches. And this is a diagram here about, well, these tree finches eat different types of food, and then probing bills are trying to find stuff. And then crushing, really strong crushing bills are need to be larger to crush hard seeds and, and everything like that. Those, these are structural adaptations. Behavioral adaptations, what's the term used for how bats locate things? Yeah, it's hopefully you said it. Can't, don't know if you did, but echolocation, right? And so behavioral adaptations involve the way an organism behaves or acts. Right here, I would have shown you a video in class, but I'm gonna put the link down at the bottom. I want you to watch it. It's awesome about how bees know where they're going um, based upon a dance <laughs> that they do. And it's crazy. I'll put, I'll put the link in the bottom of the screen. I want you to watch it. It's good. Not only that, there's functional adaptations. Emperor penguins, some of y'all are probably thinking happy feet right now. But these are functional adaptations. It, you know, 80% of the heat in their breath is recaptured. They can dive up to 1,800 feet and hold their breath for 22 minutes. So this is affecting body systems and chemistry. Their heart rate goes up to about 180 to 200. And then it can almost, it can drop down to 20 beats per minute. That's like bump. Lub dub. It's, you know, those are all functional adaptations. Can you see it? Let me draw it on the screen. Right there. That's a horrible circle. But mountain lion, this one's a little bit easier. Oh, I gotta, okay, I gotta click off. Sorry, learn how to do this. Flounder, flounder does not look like it does in Little Mermaid. I showed that to Ella Grace, and her heart was not broken, but she was just like, "That's not flounder, Dad." I'm like, "Yeah, you well, you know." What's this? You might be quick to say B, but it's not. It's a hoverfly, actually. That's harmless, harmless to you. And this is actually called mimicry. So there's camouflage and also mimicry that organisms go through. Camouflage, some of y'all might own camo, is an adaptation that enables a species to blend in with its environment. That's, a, that's an example of an adaptation. Mimicry is another one. One of these snakes, if it bites you, will kill you. And one of these snakes will not. Both are in Florida. So you might wanna know which one, right? And so I have a little saying that might save your life one day. So never, never say I didn't tell you anything that was you know, related to real life, but a, a bite from a notoriously venomous eastern coral snake at first seems anticlimactic. There's no pain, swelling, can be delayed for 12 hours. However, 
the neurotoxin, which means it's attacking your nervous system, your brain, nerve, spinal cord, begins to disrupt the connections between the brain and the muscles, causing slurred speech, double vision, and paralysis, which means eventually you cannot breathe or your heart stops beating. So here's, here it is. Red on yellow, red and yellow, kill a fellow. Red on black, friend of Jack. See it? Red on yellow, kill a fellow. Red on black, friend of Jack. I actually knew someone who was bitten by a coral snake and he started feeling the effects of it while he was in the hospital. It's a scary thing. So in closing, Darwin's coming up with his theory. He wasn't alone though on the boat. Of course he had you know, his colleagues there, the captain of course, but he was also traveling with all these thoughts and, and, and his mind and books that he brought on the ship. And like, like all of us, we're influenced by people before us. And so Lamarck, Lyle, Linnaeus, Anning, all these individuals influenced Darwin's thinking, his school, his college, his education, his upbringing. See, we're not blank slates. We are formed by our environments in some ways. You know, psychology has a lot of fun with debating that. And so he collected data, he made observations, and he created hypotheses. Then he tested them and reformulated them. And eventually that led to his, you know, ground shaking book, ground shaking work, The Origin of Species. So we're going to keep going down exactly what evolution is, and I'll try to be bringing up the I'll try to bring up the Bible to you as much as I can. But remember to check in the uh, the, the description at the bottom of this video um, for that video about bees. It's awesome. It's really interesting. And so until then, guys, I hope you're doing well. I hope you are enjoying your family and connecting with your friends and diving into God's word to get a good news every single day. If you are interested in good news, quick devotionals, I do have them on this channel. Um, it's called A Good Word. Just brief kind of thoughts from me as far as you know, God's good news that he has for us in the Bible. So until then, guys, I'll talk to you later. I hope you have a wonderful day.